Would you please turn in your Bibles to Acts uh, chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. This evening we're going to finish the chapter, verses 51 through 60, uh, Lord willing. And here we have the, um, you might say, the culmination of Stephen's uh, argument and his defense against the Jews. And you might say the application of his sermon that he has been uh, preaching. <laughs> I see we have some movement uh, in the front row to move to the back where it's not quite so cold. Um, again, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to make those adjustments so everybody will be comfortable. Okay, Acts chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 51, we see the application of the sermon. And not exactly what the Jews wanted to hear, but that which they needed to hear that they might repent and turn to the Lord. This is what Stephen says, beginning in verse 51. He says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. May the Lord bless his word to us this evening. Now Stephen, as you know, stands charged with blasphemy in the Jewish mind to say that the temple and the ceremonial law were no longer necessary is to impugn the integrity of Moses. To impugn Moses in the Jewish mind is obviously to blaspheme God because God is the one who gave him what it is he entrusted to the Jews and to blaspheme God is to warrant the death penalty according to Jewish law. Now Stephen has argued his innocence that he hasn't blasphemed Moses, that he hasn't blasphemed God, but rather he's honored both of them by preaching the gospel because Jesus is the fulfillment of these things. The council on the other hand are the ones that have blasphemed God just like their fathers in rejecting Jesus, the one that the temple, the ceremonial law, and Moses were all pointing to. Now this evening we see the conclusion of the trial. And we do some, see something very unique here in Stephen that we see in, in um, those in Scripture that God is using as well as those in the history of the church. That Stephen is not uh, seeking here to try to find a middle way to try to... to you know, ease uh, what he uh, may have said to the Jews to make them feel comfortable about it. He's not trying to win friends and influence people, but rather Stephen is resolved to honor God by nailing these charges down and making them stick in the hopes that these Jews will not be able to wiggle their way out, but will see the implications of these things, feel the weight of them and the conviction of them, and by God's grace, repent and turn to Christ. However, the, the potential of the opposite occurring is also there, and that's, as a matter of fact, what happens. This, rather than turning them from their sins, rather than bringing them to repentance, infuriates them and causes them to hand down a guilty verdict. Then they take Stephen out and execute him, stone him to death uh, for his crime, which they believe he is guilty of, of blasphemy. And interestingly enough, bestow upon Stephen the greatest honor that a Christian can ever receive, which we saw at the beginning, to be a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us. 
Stephen shows his Lord the greatest act of love possible by laying down his life for him. Now this evening what we're going, what we're going to want to look at are basically two things. The first is Stephen's final charge against the Jews and then secondly Stephen's martyrdom. First of all we see Stephen's final indictment against the Jews. We see that somehow the, the Jews were willing to sit patiently while uh, Stephen was ex expounding to them the history of the Jews, probably because the implications of what he was saying were not too clear and they were probably waiting to find out just exactly how he was going to apply them. But now he nails his accusation down. They are acting just like their fathers in resisting the Holy Spirit and disobeying God's law. And again, he doesn't mince words, he doesn't pull punches. He says, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. They're being, again, just like the Jews of old who would not listen to the prophets, who were stubborn, who were willful, who were stiff-necked, which means that they were unwilling to bend, unwilling to yield. They were hard-hearted. They would not listen to God as he spoke to them through the prophets, calling them to repentance. And the reason why they wouldn't is because of a problem in their heart. They were uncircumcised in heart and ears, which is simply a figurative way of saying they were unconverted. These images refer to the condition of their souls with respect to grace. Their hearts were hard. They were not moved by God's commandments. They had stony hearts. To have a circumcised heart means to have a heart of flesh, one that is willing to yield to God's commandments, one that is moved by what God says. But these had hardened their hearts to his conviction. They had closed their ears to his commandments. They were not open to listen and to submit. They were resisting the Holy Spirit, who is the one who speaks through the Word of God. That's what happens in the heart of an unconverted person. That's the reason why we have unbelievers out there today is because their hearts are hardened against the Lord. They were not willing to listen. Now you see the council was doing exactly the same thing that the fathers were doing. Turning a deaf ear to the Spirit as he spoke through Jesus, as he spoke through the apostles, as he was speaking through Stephen. They were resisting the work of the Holy Spirit on their consciences trying to convict them and bring them to repentance. They were hardening their hearts to this conviction. Now we know what that's like. I mean, even as Christians, we know what that's like. Sometimes we have to hear things that the Lord tells us that we don't like to hear. And the reason is because we still have some of that same hardness of heart, some of that same sin nature, some of that same corruption in us that they had. We know what it's like. We know what it feels like. But in their case... There was, there was nothing but hardness of heart, nothing but that hatred. Within our hearts, we struggle. In their hearts, there was no struggle. There was only resistance and hatred for the light, only resistance to the Holy Spirit. Like their fathers, they persecuted and killed the one that God sent to them, Stephen says in verse 52 as he continues his indictment. Which one of the prophets did your father not persecute? Your fathers. They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. Remember how earlier they were getting a little bit perturbed over the fact that the apostles continually preached that the leaders had put Jesus Christ the Messiah to death and they said, are you intending to bring this man's blood on us? They didn't like that indictment. Well, here Stephen nails them with it again. Instead of honoring the prophets who told them about the coming of the Christ, your fathers persecuted them. And like your fathers who did that, you have persecuted and betrayed and murdered the Messiah. Remember who these people are. These are the very ones who had rejected Jesus Christ. These are the ones who hired Judas who uh, gave him the money to betray Jesus Christ. These are the ones when Pilate wanted to release him, forced Pilate to condemn him. These were the ones who were his betrayers and murderers. They were showing that they were the true sons of their fathers. And again, remember that um, 
as we see the Lord bringing the gospel to his people and gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel because some of the Jews are being converted, we also see the hardness of heart within this generation of Jews that is going to bring God's judgment against them in AD 70. Remember the book of Acts takes place right in that time frame and they are uh, as it were storing up wrath. They are filling the cup of God's wrath which he is going to pour out shortly. Stephen goes on to say that like their fathers they had also rejected his law. They would not submit to it. Again acting like their fathers in their rejection of the gospel. He says you who receive the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Stephen says that in the giving of the law on Mount Sinai that the angels were involved in this process. Apparently they had something to do with it. And this of course gave greater honor and glory to the law and to the law giver and should have increased the Jews respect for it but the fathers didn't respect the law. While they were waiting for Moses to come down with that law they had already broken it. They had already made a golden calf they had already committed a capital offense against the Lord. And of course many times after that they continued to dishonor God and to break his law. And now that they had received the gospel by the mercy and grace of God and that not by the angels but rather by the Holy Spirit they wouldn't submit to that either. They didn't repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that um, the gospel is not just a promise but it actually is a commandment, isn't it? A commandment that all men are to submit to. Repent and believe the gospel. Oftentimes we, we think the, um, the gospel is, is simply a, a, an invitation, simply an, an offer of peace, and it certainly is that, but it is a command that needs to be responded to. It is one that needs to be submitted to. It is one that can be rejected, and that's exactly what they were doing, acting like their fathers many of whom were destroyed for their blasphemies against God, they are again rejecting the law of God, that commandment to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, in all of these ways, they have dishonored the Lord in rejecting his prophets, in rejecting his law, in rejecting his son, and even having put him to death. And now they were rejecting him again. They rejected Jesus when he appeared. They rejected the apostles when they preached. And now they're rejecting Stephen as he charges them again. Now Stephen, as we see here, is, seems to be cut short in the things that he had to say. Perhaps there was more he could have said, but they wouldn't let him say anything more. Now he has nailed it down, made it painfully clear, and they aren't willing to listen to anything more that he has to say. Now we might say that um, as we look at Stephen's tact, as we look at, at his strategy, that if you're concerned about saving your life, this was not a very wise thing to do. Speaking to people like this who have your life in their hands, antagonizing them, charging them with murder, charging them with sin, the very thing that they hated most of all. But you see, Stephen wasn't too concerned about that. He was concerned rather about giving glory and honor to the Lord who gave him this grand opportunity to tell the Jews about Christ. And again, it doesn't matter what the results are as to whether or not Stephen gets a reward for this or whether or not he's honoring God and is pleasing to God. The fact that they hated him and rejected him did not mean that God did not receive what he had to do, or what he was doing here, but rather God would give him a reward for his obedience. This is a wise thing to do if your concern is pleasing and honoring God. So we say that Stephen was not unwise. I think I mentioned to you once before, I knew somebody who had been a missionary. And he said, and he was a rather unusual character from a different perspective altogether, but he said if he was, uh, if he was ever caught in a country where uh, it was against the law to preach the gospel or to be a Christian, and they confronted him with that, he would simply deny the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, when he was set free, he would ask forgiveness for his sins and then he would continue to go on. Well, you see, Stephen was not willing to do that because to do that would be to dishonor the Lord. To do that would be to deny Christ before men and to run the risk of denying, uh, having Christ deny you before the Father. Uh, if we are willing to give up Christ every time our life is in danger, 
Uh, that says something about the reality of our Christianity. Now, Stephen, it is possible for weak Christians to deny the Lord. I mean, don't, don't mistake this, because Peter did exactly that. But after he did that and was ashamed of that, and by the way, that was before the day of Pentecost, although Peter also sinned a sin of hypocrisy. After that, it didn't render him infallible. Uh, it is not the character of a Christian to deny the Lord. And certainly to do it flippantly, as um, this, this one person I was referring to did, uh, a Christian can't think along those lines. His heart is, is not like that. He wants to honor the Lord, and that's what Stephen did. Now this leads us to our next point, which tells us that Stephen's honoring of Christ and his gospel cost him his life. He sealed his testimony with his blood. Now the first thing we see under this point is the sin or the increasing sin, evil and wickedness of the persecutors. Remember that um, uh, the gospel has again two effects. It's either going to soften and draw people to the Lord or it's going to harden and drive them away and sometimes it can drive them into greater sin. Now it's not the person who is proclaiming the gospel that's making them sin. It's not the gospel that becomes sin because they respond negatively to it, uh, you know, to that gospel, but it's their own wickedness. Sometimes the gospel can stir up the wickedness that's already in a person's heart, and if they respond to it in that way, they are the ones who are guilty for it. Not you because you told them, you see. We have to do what is right. We have to tell them the truth. That's the only means by which they'll be saved. But if they sin against that and get angry and they hate you for it and want to destroy you, you're not at fault for stirring up some kind of sin in them. They're the ones at fault. You are honoring the Lord. Well, we see that Stephen, in honoring the Lord, um, finds that preaching the gospel to them does stir up evil inside of them. We read in verse 54, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. What Stephen said pierced them to the heart. They were enraged by what he had to say, by the exposing of their sins. We might uh, you know, try to guess what was going on within their hearts. Surely they knew they were guilty. The Holy Spirit must have been convicting them of their sins. There is no way that they could answer his argument. They had put Jesus Christ to death. They had been resisting the Holy Spirit. They were acting just as their fathers who persecuted the prophets. But you notice their response was just greater evil. Instead of repenting, they became angry. Stephen now, instead of appearing to them as an angel as he did earlier, as the Lord was seeking to um, perhaps show them his witness of Stephen, the fact that he was with him, by giving him this appearance as an angel, now he appeared to them as a devil. Darkness hates the light. Stephen was shining the light in their eyes. They hated that. They wanted to put it out. And the gnashing of their teeth against him shows the intensity of their anger. Scripture says they cried out with a loud voice in verse 57. They wanted to express their anger against him. They wanted perhaps to incite one another to greater anger they wanted to drown out what he had to say so they wouldn't have to listen to it any further. Now again, this shouldn't surprise us because haven't there been times when you've tried to tell other people about Christ or maybe even brethren about their sins and they don't want to listen to it so they begin to interrupt, they begin to talk over you, they begin to become rude because they want to stop you from talking. Well, that's exactly what they were doing here only on a much larger scale. They covered their ears. Maybe as a, as a pious sign, you know how the Jews sometimes uh, tear their garments because of their outrage at something. Well, they're covering their ears. They don't want to hear any more of this blasphemy. Especially when Stephen said, I see the heavens opened. I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You know, to the Jewish mind, what, what he was saying was, this one that they condemned as a criminal, this Jesus, the one that they executed, that he's been exalted to the right hand of God, that would only increase the blasphemy in their minds. Caiaphas tore his clothes when Jesus said exactly the same thing. Jesus said to him, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. They didn't want to listen to this anymore. They rejected that. They rejected his message. They rejected Jesus Christ 
one more time. And again, in doing so, they're revealing that they're guilty of the very thing that um, Stephen said they were guilty of. You have an uncircumcised heart. You have uncircumcised ears. God has left you in your blindness. He has left you in your hardness. Even as Jesus said, he spoke to the people in parables so that the leaders that God was bringing his judgment on would not see, would not hear, would not be converted. Stephen was right. These men were being left to the judgment of God. We read that they rushed upon him with one impulse. They cast him out of the city and they started stoning him. Uh, having condemned him to death. Now we believe here, even though it doesn't tell us that the process was completed, it probably was completed in a matter of just a couple of moments, that uh, there was a verdict that was handed down. There certainly were witnesses involved in this because the witnesses were the first ones who lifted their hands against him, but they had completed the trial. A uh, verdict of guilty was handed down for blasphemy and they enacted, of course, the death penalty for that blasphemy as they sought very hypocritically to honor the law of Moses. Leviticus 24.16 Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Do you realize that uh, when Caiaphas heard what Jesus had to say, that you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. He said, blasphemy. You have heard the blasphemy. What, what need do we have of further witnesses? He has blasphemed and he deserves death. So basically, the same judgment they passed on the Lord Jesus Christ is the same judgment they passed on Stephen. And when it came time to stone him, the hands of the witnesses were the first against him, again, according to the law of Moses. We read in verse 58, when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now this is the way the witnesses would confirm that their testimony was true. They would be the first ones to pick up the stones and stone him. And since stoning was hard work, they had to take off their garments. And um, notice they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. I don't know if you remember, but earlier on as we were looking at Stephen arguing with the Jews, uh, those of the synagogue of the freedmen, and let's see, it says from um, including Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, uh, we noted that that's exactly where Paul had come from. He was a, a freeborn uh, Jew. He could have been in the synagogue of the freedmen. He was from uh, Tarsus, which was in Cilicia, I believe. So he may very well have been one of these arguing with Stephen. And now we see him here consenting to Stephen's death, as he will say later on in his own testimony, when they were stoning Stephen, the Lord's witness. I stood by consenting to their death and even watched the coats of the young men who were stoning him. Now obviously in all of this, they were sinning wickedly against the Lord by putting a man to death who had done nothing other than speak the truth to them. And they were killing him merely because they did not want to listen, they did not want to repent, they did not want to amend their ways. Sometimes you might think the Lord Jesus was a bit harsh on the Jews by saying to them, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to a people who will prepare or produce its fruits. But we see just how deep the wickedness of these Jews actually went in their sinning against the Son of God by putting him to death and sinning against the apostles who continued to try to bring them to repentance and in their sins against Stephen as they stoned him to death for doing what they should have rejoiced that he was doing, trying to show them their sins and to bring them to faith in Christ so they might escape judgment and actually stand before the Lord in heaven on that day. So we see their evil on the one hand, but lastly we see the grace that God gave to Stephen while he was being stoned, uh, fulfilling again what, um, well, what we saw in Psalm 23, how the Lord said he would be with, with us in the valley of the shadow of death, how he would never forsake us, how we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and what a comfort that would be. And also what the Apostle Peter 
said as he was seeking to encourage those who were also suffering persecution and going through trials. He says in 1 Peter 4 verses 12 through 14, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now certainly Stephen was being reviled for the glory of God, for the name of Christ. And we see here in a very powerful way the Spirit of God resting upon him and giving him the strength that he needs to go through this execution. First we see the communion that he had with the Lord Jesus Christ in these final moments. Christ revealed himself to Stephen in order to comfort him. While they were filled with hatred against him, while they were um, seeking to kill him, he was filled with the Spirit. And he looked into heaven and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Notice that in this difficulty he was not looking at his persecutors, being afraid of them, but he was looking to heaven. He wasn't looking for a way to escape, but rather he was looking to Jesus for the strength to face what he was about to face. And again, this reminds us that if our hearts are really in heaven, if that's really where we desire to be, we won't be afraid of death. We won't uh, fear to leave this world. We'll actually look forward to it, even as uh, this young man named Saul later will when he becomes the Apostle Paul. To depart and to be with Christ is very much better. We see that Stephen was looking to heaven, uh, perhaps also to, um, to show the Lord how much he desired to give glory and honor to him. And he submitted by submitting basically to what the Lord had for him. He knew that he was going to die. And so he did what every saint ought to be doing at this time, seeking to give glory to God, looking toward heaven. And the Spirit of God gave him the strength to do exactly that. He saw heaven opened. He saw the glory of God revealed to him. You know, we don't know exactly what he saw because remember, no man has ever seen God, but God sometimes uh, uh, reveals himself in various ways. Perhaps uh, he saw some representation of God, but certainly he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, standing at the right hand of God, the one whom Stephen loved the one who had lived, the one who had died, the one who had rose again from the dead, the one who had ascended into heaven, the one who was now glorified, standing at the place of honor at the right hand of God. You know, when Ezekiel and Isaiah saw the, the glory of God, when they stood in the council room of God, Matthew Henry notes that um, they saw the Lord, some representation, it was probably the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate state, and the angels around him. In this case, Stephen sees the representation of God, but he sees the Son of God. And that would have been, of course, something much more honoring to the Lord, much more glorious to see, not just the angels, but to see the Lord Jesus Christ, who has far greater glory than any of the angels. But again, as Stephen said that, as he, as he remarked that that's what he saw, that incited the Jews even more because it was the proof that Jesus had been exalted, even as he said that he would. And again, notice that when Stephen saw Jesus, he wasn't sitting. I don't know if you've, you've heard expositions of, of exactly what that means. You know, Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, sat at the right hand of God, sitting at this place of honor until all of his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. But in this case, they see, Stephen sees him standing. Now, why was he standing rather than sitting? Well, it could be that he was standing ready to receive Stephen, the soul of his martyr, and to give him the crown of life. The fact that Jesus was standing, as it were, ready to come to his aid, gave him the courage that he needed to face this execution. If God is for us, who can be against us? If Christ was for him, who did he have to fear? Or whom did he have to fear? No one. Even as Christ was strengthened by an angel before his crucifixion, 
Stephen was strengthened by a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We have to admit there couldn't be any greater comfort than that. And Stephen didn't keep this to himself. Apparently the Jews didn't see it, but he spoke about what he saw. And as I've said, it convicted them even further. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then Stephen called out on the Lord as they were stoning him. And this, this would probably be the most difficult thing to do. But again, shows the fact Stephen was full of grace and full of the Holy Spirit. In verse 59, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And again, he said, do not lay uh, this, this uh, sin or do not hold this sin against them. Now again, remember Stephen, sometimes we might be tempted when we're going through difficult times to, um, to hate God for what we're going through. Sometimes, you know, Christians, at least professing Christians, when they have to go through great difficulties, they get angry at God because they believe that, well, you know, God is the one who has brought this about. God is the one who is, is sovereign. And he willed that I go through this. And they begin to resent God for this. But I want you to notice that Stephen did not resent Jesus for this. He did not hate Jesus because of what was going on. He accepted it and knew that whatever God had planned was good and knew that this was something that Jesus had planned for his life that he might honor him for. And again, realized also what a great honor it was. I think I told you before that there was a time in the history of the church where Christians, at least some Christians, almost lined up at the Colosseum to be put to death by the wild beasts so that they could honor the Lord in this way. To be a martyr uh, was, was the highest honor, the greatest status that a Christian could achieve because they knew what that meant. Giving your life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Stephen did not resent Jesus for this, but rather just asked him for the strength to get through this. Lord Jesus receive my spirit and he asked the Lord to give him that grace and to receive him and again Henry points out this that when it comes time to die we ought to be looking to Christ we ought to be looking to the mediator we ought to be looking to the one who makes us acceptable to God we are to trust the Lord Jesus Christ through our entire lives for our acceptance with God well how much more when it comes time to die ought we to be looking to him. And I want you to notice that Stephen was not really concerned about his body so much as he was about his soul. He was about, well actually in the process of this, he was giving his body over to be bruised and broken and to die. But his concern was his soul. As long as his soul was safe, he wasn't concerned about his body. And the only way that his soul could be safe was again by looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the Lord tells us that we have to confess Him, even to death. One thing that Jonathan Edwards once said, and this is true when you, when you see it in His proper light, a person might profess Jesus Christ all the way to the end of their life and deny Him. That is possible. It's not possible for a Christian, but it is possible for somebody who isn't. We have to profess the Lord Jesus Christ all the way to the end even to our death. And if it should be in this way where we're actually being hated, persecuted, and put to death for the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot deny him. We must hold fast to him. And that's what Stephen did. Again, continuing to look to Christ for his acceptance with God, not hating Jesus, but trusting in him. And remembering that what Paul says is true. If this earthly tent, which is our body, is torn down, we have a building eternal in the heavens, one not made with hands. His receiving our souls at death is the thing that we need to be most concerned about. And if we know we have Jesus, we know that we will have that comfort that we need when it comes time to do that. Now the last thing I want us to see is simply Stephen's disposition toward his enemies. Because that, as I said at the outset, is one of the most difficult things to do. Stephen is doing here perhaps two of the most difficult things in life. He is dying for his faith. 
And in the midst of his execution, he is praying for his enemies. This again shows us God's grace in his life. He knelt down to pray. Verse 60, Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He prayed that the Lord would not charge them with the guilt of this death. He was following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ that we saw in the meditation where Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Stephen again is being a witness to them. He is preaching to them in his prayers. He is preaching a sermon about forgiveness. That he did not want revenge, but rather that God might show them mercy. If they would just repent, God would have mercy. And especially in light of this, if they didn't repent, their sins would be greatly aggravated and their judgment would be as well. You know, actually, some believe that in answer to this prayer, the Lord converted the Apostle Paul. Uh, St. Augustine says this, Do you think that Paul heard Stephen pray this prayer? It is likely he did and ridiculed it then, but afterwards he had the benefit of it and fared the better for it. When the Lord Jesus Christ prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, there were those who heard him that were converted. When Stephen prayed, we know that Saul later was converted, perhaps in answer to this prayer. This again reminds us what the Lord tells us. We need to love our enemies. We need to pray for those who persecute us. Do good to those who do evil to us. We need to be a witness to them. Even in our death, can you imagine how difficult it would be to do this? I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine the kind of grace a person would need to pray for those who are killing you, throwing rocks at you. I mean, those as they're, as they're crushing you, as they're crushing the life out of you. To pray for them, that God would not hold them guilty, but might have mercy upon them. But that's the kind of love that God calls us to, and that's the kind of love that His Spirit can produce within us. Paul says we need to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, and one of the reasons is that we might be able to do what uh, the Lord calls us to do, even in the most difficult circumstances. Now with this we see Stephen fell asleep. And again, this reminds us that when Christians die, they don't go into soul sleep. You know, they don't perish. As uh, Paul was encouraging the Thessalonians, don't think that those who have died in the Lord Jesus Christ before his return have perished. Christ is going to bring them with him when he returns. Those who die in the Lord, they don't, they don't actually die. Christ has taken the sting out of death. Instead, they are said simply to fall asleep. That is, their bodies go into the grave to await the resurrection, while their souls go to be with the Lord. And again, in this case, that's exactly what happened to Stephen. And it happened in the most God-honoring way. It is a blessing to die for the Christian, but especially when you are doing the Lord's will. Especially when you are doing what is the most difficult thing to do, which is loving and praying for your enemies. And I'm hoping that through this example, the Lord would encourage all of us to not be afraid of man, but to be willing to take a stand. And if the Lord should allow us or, or you know, ordain that, if he has ordained that we be persecuted, for being a witness, that we wouldn't be ashamed of that, we wouldn't get angry at God for that, we wouldn't draw away from the Lord, but rather we would be thankful that, that the Lord allowed us to stand in the place of Christ and to take that abuse that is meant for Christ on ourselves, even as Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself for us. May the Lord give us the grace to face persecution and even death as Stephen did as he was following what our Lord Jesus Christ did as well. May he give us the grace to serve him in life and to honor him even in our deaths. Well, may the Lord apply this word to us this evening. Let's uh, bow for a few moments of meditative prayer.